Hey, Rob, how are you? Good, Mike. How you doing? Good, Rob. I was just wondering the way that you constructed the roster around LeBron and AD uh, the past two seasons, how that impacted the way that you built this roster and what you found to be most important uh, across that time. Yeah, I think <clears throat> going into uh, the draft and free agency, there were really three primary goals and objectives that we wanted to accomplish with the roster. Um, one was adding um, playmaking or a, a primary playmaker. Um, two was shooting. And then three was shifting back to, especially defensively, a model of um, you know sort of two rebounding defensive centers like we had in, when we won the championship in 2020. And, um, those were the, the goals we had in mind, and I think if you look at the complexion of the roster, we feel like we addressed each of those three goals, and um, that was something we set out to do, so we feel, we feel good about that. And then, Rob, understandable focus around and interest in Russell Westbrook coming in, but I want to ask you about Anthony Davis. Uh, he had cited how last offseason being so short had a definite impact on him. Just wonder what you've seen this, this offseason from him and what expectations that, that you kind of collectively have for what his season's going to be coming up. You know, AD's a quiet worker. He goes about his business, and I think he's been in the building a few times, and all of us can just tell the work he's put in and how serious he is about it. Uh, I guess he's added wedding singing to his repertoire too, which is exciting. We were all at his wedding and enjoyed him serenading his bride. <laughs> But I, I think when you when you get into AD's mindset, I think there's two primary goals. Um, one is to win a championship, for sure. He talks about that with this team. And then two is he knows that he belongs to be in that saying of the most dominant and the best two-way player in the game. And I think he has the skills and he is that player. And he worked um, very hard this off season. I think you'll you'll see him accomplish those two things with this season, in my opinion. All right, Dave McMenamin, please. Hey, Rob, good to see you. What's the vaccination status of your team, and what do you expect the availability to be for your roster as uh, training camp opens up? You know, we've worked really hard with our UCLA health partners and our team doctors and and players and agents and family members and. Um, we will be on opening night when we play the Golden State Warriors. Um, um, all of the players that are currently signed on our roster um, that night will be deemed fully vaccinated. And we're really uh, we're, we're grateful for that. I think um, just in collaboration again with, the, with, with UCLA and the doctors and people internally, um, uh, we, we We'll be grateful that we won't have interruptions caused by unvaccinated status of a player or a staff member. Thank you. All right, Kyle Goon. Hey, Rob. Good to see you. Um, kind of a two-part question. A lot of guys kind of describe the grind of of last year, and, and just with all the restrictions and and various uh, limitations. What well, one? What do you expect to kind of get back? this year with some of those um, being lifted? And, and two, um, what kind of uh, sort of daily culture do you anticipate having in the building with, with this roster? Yeah, I think we're incredibly excited, obviously, with the guidance of um, the, you know, the local authorities and with the state, but we're excited that it looks like Staples Center will be full with Lakers fans um, for opening night, um, obviously in a safe way um, and following all the guidelines. But just more than anything and, and talking with our guys, just getting the energy of our fans back is going to be incredible. You know, maybe one of the, the bright spots for the start of the season. Um, it was a hard grind to play night after night without you know our fans and I think it takes a toll so um, we're just we're uh, grateful to be in a place where we can play the Warriors again on opening night in Staples Center and, and plan to do that in a safe way with our fans there um, cheering on this team and I know coach has talked about Russell and the first game and being at home and all the energy he brings we may have to take a timeout after 90 seconds because uh He'll be so uh, gassed up to get going. Um, but I just think overall this team, the, the way we built it, 
the, the, the energy that Lakers Nation brings night in, night out, and Staples Center is going to be a key ingredient to our success. To our success. All right, Brad Turner, please. How you doing, Rob? What's up, man? I, I hope you're having duck from lunch from your recipe and <laughs> that you got when you were in Paris. Well, I think that'll happen on Sunday. So okay. All right. Fo football Sunday. <laughs> right. You know, we keep talking about it. Everybody on your team except for LeBron James. And I'm just curious, have you seen him much at the facility? And what does he look like? And what are you hearing about his whole approach and attitude about this season? Um, I have LeBron's been in working hard, working really early in the morning, and I, I think the thing that stands out is just his his fitness level, and um, he slimmed up. I think um, you know we all know LeBron studies the greats, and he adds things into his game. And I think um, going into this stage of his career, he's made a decision to come back a little bit leaner, and I think that's going to translate in his explosiveness and quickness. Um, but he's been he's been very very locked in with his training, and um, you just get a sense he has a confidence in his teammates. He really does. I, I think um, when he looks around the locker room and sees the name plates or with the guys he's been on the court with, you can just tell he has a, a high level of confidence in his teammates and uh, what this team could accomplish this season if we if we all lock in. I think the big word is mindset. You know, what, what will the mindset of all these players be? We have 13 guys signed to contracts, and it just feels like this group realizes that everyone's going to have to set a little bit of a personal thing or a selfish desire aside to come together and have the mindset of how do I make the guy next to me in the locker room great? And it just feels like that's LeBron's mindset right now with his teammates and that he has a belief. All right, we'll go over to Bill Orem, please. Happy to be Rob. Hey, Bill. You know, in Melo, you've got a guy who's, you know, 10 leading scorer of all time, you know, first ballot Hall of Famer when the time comes. Um, you know, there, he'd been kind of linked to the Lakers over the years at, at various times. I'm curious what, in your mind, made, from your perspective, he shared this a, a few weeks ago when we spoke to him, but what made this a good fit for you guys and, and why this was the right time for him and what you've seen from him around the gym over the last uh, however long he's been around. We had to get McMenamin a Syracuse orange man because he's been badgering me about that for the last three years. But <laughs> putting that aside to seriously answer your question, um, you know, one of the ingredients that I, we felt like we really missed last year was just guys that were lasers that could space the floor and make, make catch and shoot. And with the, if you look at AD and the, when he gets double teamed or when teams you know, collapse the pain against LeBron and obviously now with Russell Westbrook, just having to me one of the greatest catch and shoot guys that has played in recent times. Um, he, and most of that is just because of his confidence level. I think if you go back to the Olympics when, when Melo played such an incredible role on that team um, with just his ability to, to make open shots, I think there's some players when you play with with, with people like LeBron or Russell, maybe when that open ball is kicked to you, it's a little bit heavier. Um, but Melo, I don't think he's paying attention to who's throwing him the ball. He's just getting it and he's locked in to convert. And then he has other dimensions to his game too. I'm not trying to uh, minimize him into a catch and shoot player, but that's an elite, elite skill he has. And um, I think the other underrated parts of his game are just he's still so physically strong and imposing. I think um, just when he puts his body on players in the post, he can continue to have his way and um, could continue to be a, you know, a rebounder with his size. So those ingredients together, I think, are going to make him a really good fit. Thanks, Rob. I'm still waiting for my first Montana Grizzly, by the way. <laughs> I was actually in Montana this summer, um, and it's a great, great state. Went and saw... Uh, Coach Phil Jackson at his house, um, and uh, I'll start scouting more in Montana. It's pretty beautiful. Extra class professionalism. Um, I, I, I think uh, one of the things I was wondering, um, in terms of your cap situation this offseason, did you view kind of Talon 
and Caruso is sort of an either or situation um, based on sort of the tax that you guys would be running up into as a roster. And I guess what made you want to invest in Taylor? What did you see? What do you think you will see um, going forwards with that player? Um, we we made an aggressive attempt to re-sign Alex Caruso, and we made an aggressive attempt attempt to keep Taylor. Um, and that's the thing with unrestricted free agency is um, you can be in the mix, but players you know control the ultimate choice. And uh, Alex was tremendous here as a championship player, and you know if, if we'll be forever grateful for his contributions and his growth and. Um, seeing him go from a G League to you know a two way to a elite player was something we'll always be proud of. Um, but he had choices and, and he chose another team. But we 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 pursued him and wanted to keep him. Um, same with Taylor and um, obviously came to a deal with Taylor and, and Alex moved on. But you know we had a we had a plan to take some of the skill set that Alex brought to the table and and find that in other free agents that were available and I think if you look at how we ended up you know filling out the roster um, it was important for us to be strong in all the different basketball categories and we felt like we dimensionalized that with some of the other guys we signed well, where, where do you think the next step for for Taylor is um, and and obviously you know by bringing him back and whenever he did that's a lot of confidence in him what do you think sort of his ceiling is and how quickly can he get there? I think Taylor's got to establish himself as a dominant defensive player. I think that's going to be the expectations on him. Um, we know, you guys know Frank Vogel prides himself on that end. He builds everything with his defense. And there's, there's nothing that Taylor doesn't have to keep him from being an elite player. Just we all know about his publicized incredible wingspan, broad shoulders, quickness, athleticism. Um, you know, if he makes a choice to, to dominate you on the defensive end with his body and his length and his athleticism, that could be a nightmare for opponents. So I think it starts there. And then I think we want to see him grow as a, as, a, as a playmaker. I think he knows he's got to slow his game down. But I think when he, when he gets in the paint, if, if he has an open vision where he can see guys in the corners or open teammates when the defense collapse, I think growing in his reads, those are some of the areas that we see that that he, he will have you know great success in and add dimensions to his game this year for sure. Um. All right, we'll go over to Jovan, please. Hey, Rob. Um, you, you guys have a couple of empty roster spots. So what, what is the plan with, with those two spots? And are you looking at a particular position or skill set? Yeah, I think we do have two open roster spots, 14 and 15. Um, most likely 15 will be held um, just with the tax implications um, and also holding that for potentially, um, you know, the buyout deadline is usually a, a tool that a lot of contenders use. So I think that there's a likelihood there. It's not an absolute. We're always fluid and anything could be presented. And then we are in kind of our final evaluations on what to do with the 14th spot. And that's something that we will make a decision um, on and around before camp starts on Tuesday. So still kind of evaluating that as we speak. All right, let's go over to Mark Medina, please. Hey Rob, good to see you. Um, a two-part question here. What do you think has been the common thread uh, with a lot of the guys on this team, the star players and role players that explain how they've been able to have a lot of longevity? And, and given the you know the collective age, what's the overall approach the training staff's going to take to try to maximize their chances for good health? So we're moving towards more of a customized um, model around players. I think we live in a world where the TV we watch is more customized. The, you know, the food we eat when we go out to restaurants, we have more of a say in, in how to create a, a bowl or to make a meal. And uh, I just think it's really smart to, to customize our approach for what services we put around a player on the training side. So there's going to be a big focus on that with our staff going into camp. Um, but I think we've all seen over the last several years the, the amount of time and money that athletes are investing in into their sports performance and their bodies, into their nutrition, into the, the way they take care of themselves. 
is translating into more athletic performances, um, you know, records being broken um, in, in, in times of marathon sprints, just play, players, men and women are just getting more athletic. And so I think that translates into players playing longer in their career as well. And, you know, the ultimate example, of course, right now in professional sports, we all saw what, what the Super Bowl ended up last year with Tom Brady kind of leading his team at his age. It's staggering, but that's due to a commitment um, to taking care of his body. And I think if you go through our roster and all of these players, that's something that um, is deeply ingrained in each of their work habits. And um, I think you'll see throughout this year just the way guys approach the weight room, the way guys approach recovery, nutrition. Um, I think there's going to be a, a high level of commitment to keeping players on the floor. Uh, and that service is something that we have to meet the bar of excellence on with all of our players from the first guy on the roster all the way down to the last man. We have to have a commitment to that, and we do. All right, we'll go to Alan Sliwa next, please. Hey Rob, um, just one thing that you had mentioned about um, making sure hopefully the players obviously set aside uh, any selfish goals, kind of doing it as a team together. I'm just curious, in the offseason, how much does that play into everything that you're doing? So you're trying to find maybe more shooters or playmakers or so forth. How much did that come into the equation? You know, I think, uh, again, uh, the, the guiding word for us was mindset. What is the mindset of a player coming in here to be on this Lakers roster? And there is a really firm belief in each of these guys and their ability to have the right mindset where there is those characteristics of about, hey, this isn't all about me. This is about getting the 18th title. And I think there's a palpable feeling, there's a palpable taste in your mouth that when this group of guys is in the gym or around each other, there's a respect for, hey, we have a chance to do something special this year. And we all have to make sacrifices to get there. And I think this group shares that common belief in the assumption that sacrifices will have to be made, but there's something greater that we can accomplish. Now, that doesn't mean we walk in the gym and we're contenders. It means we walk in the gym with a belief in one another and a belief that we're going to put in that work to get there. And this is a serious group of guys. You can just feel it. It's a very, very serious group of players that are very locked into what they want to accomplish. And I think some of the players are at a stage in their career where, I mean, Melo said it publicly and said it really well the other day, like, hey, I almost felt like maybe I was going to walk away from the game without really having a chance for a championship. But now I do. And I'm not going to hold that lightly. I'm going to embrace that and I'm going to make the most of it. I think that mindset trickles down to every single player on this roster that I've talked to extensively when it was free agency time or extensively since we've signed him about what it's going to take to come in here with the right approach. Um, I think Frank Vogel and the coaching staff feel that. Um, Kurt and I, the front office, Jeannie, we all feel that way about this group of guys and now we just have to go out and execute. All right, we have time for two last follow-ups, so we'll start with Bill Oram. Hey, Rob, I'll, reserve, I'll uh, resist the temptation to ask you for a review of uh, Space Jam. But, um, you know, you basically turned over, uh, more or less entirely turned over a roster that was number one in defense last year. Um, what are, with what moves you were able to make, what are your uh, defensive goals for this team? Is there a, a range that you would want to see this team finish or you would expect it to be able to achieve defensively? What, what are kind of the, what's kind of the standard that you expect defensively? I think, Bill, the good news is, you know, we have seen, you know, this Coach Vogel effect defensively where with last year's group, with the group before, where his system and his discipline and his teaching and his, his you know, focus on that side of the ball translated into success. And, of course, part of that was personnel, of course. Part of that is also system and teaching and accountability. And so we have a belief in this group with some of the guys that were added with players like, you know, Kent Bazemore, Trevor Ariza, I could go down the list, that there is going to be a massive commitment um, to defense and rebounding and those, those cornerstone elements that are key to, to winning at a high level. 
Um, and I don't, I don't have any concerns about um, us being a, a very, very strong team defensively. I, I believe in the group's commitment um, and the effort and coaches teaching at that end that I think will be successful as a defensive ball club. All right, we'll go ahead and end with Dan White, please. Rob, just kind of a housekeeping question. Um, are you anticipating um, all the, the main sort of roster guys to be available at the starting training camp? Does anybody have any kind of nagging things they're working through right now, or are you guys be fully healthy at that point? Nothing I'm aware of currently that would keep a player from participating in camp.